Sorry, I'm late. Um, so we started talking about hypothesis testing to states. Um, just to remind you the setting, quantum system is prepared in a state rho or sigma, and your goal, then the system is handed to you, and your goal is to perform a measurement to figure out uh, <coughs> which state was prepared. We proved that, um, so we started looking at the symmetric setting. Um, hypothesis testing, I'll just call it HC, right? So that's where rho is prepared with the probability lambda. Kind of trivial if lambda is exactly zero or exactly one. Okay. And sigma is prepared with probability one minus nine. Okay. Then in that setting, we proved that the minimum error probability, uh, we had a notation, it's a function of these three parameters, lambda, rho, and sigma. So we proved that this is equal to lambda plus the minimization overall measurement operators of this objective function. Trace m one minus lambda sigma minus lambda rho. Okay, that's a semi-definite program. We then stated the Halevo Hellstrom theorem or Hellstrom Halevo theorem. So that says that um, we're positive semi definite operators A and B. This equality holds. So this is like the expression for the error probability. To get error probability, you pick A to be lambda rho and B to be one minus lambda sigma. Right? And then this was actually the initial expression we used for error probability and it kind of easily reduces to this one. So Hellstrom Halevo asserts that there's a kind of closed form expression for this. Which is by this expression. And there you see trace distance appears, and this gives you a fundamental operational meaning. Or trace distance. It's, it's directly, directly related to distinguishability of two states. Okay. So if we pick uh, A to be, as we say here, then tra you know, trace of rho is one, trace of sigma is one. These are quantum states. Lambda plus one minus lambda is one. So this evaluates to one. One half times one minus lambda rho minus one minus lambda so. Okay. And then if we further pick the prior probability to be half, right? Then it further reduces to um, this expression. And there you see the trace distance of two, sorry trace distance of two states arrives, okay? So think about two different extremes of the trace distance. Um, if the states are the same, then <clears throat> rho minus sigma is zero, trace norm of zero is zero. And then the error probability is one half, 
which is exactly what you can achieve, achieve with just random yes. You know, like the coin is flipped, the state is chosen, and then you randomly pick the side if it's one or the other. Then you'll be correct half of the time. And so that's consistent with random guess. Um, and that's kind of expected because if the states are the same, then they're just indistinguishable. Right? Yeah. Trace distance. Yes. So there's trace norm. Um, do this. It's also the sum of the singular value. Of A. Right? So that's its definition mathematically. And then this is where it gets its like operational or physical interpretation. The other extreme is when rho and sigma are perfectly distinguishable. Okay? Um, when they're orthogonal. So if you were to pick rho, let's think about another extreme. So pick rho. To be zero and sigma to be one, then rho minus sigma is the z operator, right? It's not really relevant here to think of it as the z operator. The singular values of this matrix are one and one. For a Hermitian matrix, it's also the sum of the absolute value of the eigenvalues. Okay. And so here you have the eigenvalues in front of you, plus one, minus one, absolute values one and one. So you add those and you'll get two. One half times two is one, one minus one is zero. So you get what you'd expect for that extreme. Okay. The states are perfectly distinguishable because they're orthogonal. And then the error probability in this distinguishability experiment is zero. Okay. And then, you know, we can smoothly go away from those extremes. So they might be epsilon close or, you know, uh, <clears throat> two minus epsilon far in trace distance. So, okay. The objective now is to prove this statement. And it's really just a mathematical proof. Um, I'm not sure when we do this, we see any kind of intuition. Um, we will figure out the optimal measurement. So that's interesting, right? Or n optimal measurement. There's actually a number of them. This Okay, so to kind of prove this equality, we're going to let M be an arbitrary measurement operator. Okay. So, what does that mean? That's to satisfy these operator inequalities. Okay, then we're going to set delta to be A minus B. That's the expression that appears in this trace distance. And it's, it's relevant because it's related to the distinguishability. Okay, now we're gonna do something. We probably talked about it in the math review. I can't remember. Um, we're gonna let delta plus and delta minus be the uh, positive negative parts of delta. What does that mean? Um, that means that delta can be written as delta plus minus delta minus. Um, delta plus and delta minus are both positive semi-definite. Okay. But even though we say Negative part, it's still a positive sum definite operator. It's a negative part because it has a minus sign as well. Okay. And when you see this, you might wonder well, what's the difference between delta plus, delta minus, and A and B, right? Well, it's that we can choose delta plus to be orthogonal to delta minus. Okay. 
So um, a simple way to understand this is that A and B are Hermitian. So delta is Hermitian as well. It has a spectral decomposition. Let's do this over here. So it has a spectral decomposition like this. Delta plus is going to be um, the part that includes the positive eigenvector. Okay, so it's just like you chop up, remember, all these eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. And so we're chopping off the, the negative eigenvalues and retaining only those terms in the sum that are positive. Delta minus is you retain all the ones that are negative. Then we put an absolute value of one. And so delta minus is a positive semi definite operator. Right? And then, you know, the indices that are kept are distinct. And so because all these eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other, delta minus and delta plus are orthogonal. Okay. This is kind of a common trick. If you're dealing with a, a non commutative situation, do something to bring about orthogonality because it makes everything much simpler. And that is the case here. Okay. So that's really kind of a, a key idea. And then there are other, other few key ideas. The proof is not terribly long. So let's, let's write it. Okay. This is the objective function that we're interested in. We're going to use this decomposition to get a lower bound. And then we're, we're going to come up with, we're, we're going to choose, a, um, we're going to use the decomposition to come up with a lower bound that's independent of M. Okay. And then we're going to figure out an M that achieves the lower bound. That's, that's the idea. Okay. Start with the objective function. Trace. Uh, Okay. Now what? We want to get um, we want to get a minus b. So yes, we rewrite this as trace of a minus trace of m a minus b. Okay. Simple rewriting. Then now we have a minus b. So we're going to substitute delta. Right, and then delta plus minus delta minus. Now we can get rolling. Um, we know that um, M is positive semi-definite and delta minus is positive semi-definite. The trace of two positive semi definite operators multiplied is a non negative number. That we argued previously. Okay, so um, what does that mean? Yeah, we're going to work with this expression for a little bit. Um, That means that we can drop this term, uh, an upper bound, time time bound, right? It's dropping a uh, negative number. All right. Now we know that M, M is positive some definite and delta plus is positive some definite. Furthermore, M is less than identity. Okay. So, Write this identity. This is a manipulation we could do. I believe we did it before in a different context. Of course, this is the same as Delta. All right. So using that, this equation star is there's a minus sign in front of here, so we flip everything. There's a minus sign in front of the second term. So we flip the inequalities and we get. There is a trace of A minus trace of delta plus. 
Good. Now, um, <clears throat> right. So just collecting everything, this altogether implies that the objective function is greater than this term here. This is all, this is a lower term. Okay, so this this indeed right here, this lower bounds is an expression that's independent of F. We've already achieved that goal. Now we just need to rewrite the lower bounds in terms of trace distance, because trace distance is something more meaningful than trace of delta plus. So we technically we could stop here, but then theorem wouldn't be as pretty. Okay, so um how can we think of the trace distance of A and B? Well, according to the definition, this is trace of the absolute value of A minus B, right? Um, so that, that's just going to be the sum of the absolute value of the eigenvalues. Um, this is the same as the Definition of delta is the trace of the absolute value of delta. What is the absolute value of delta? Well, delta we can rewrite as delta plus minus delta minus. And so um, it's just going to be trace of delta plus plus delta minus. The absolute, let's do this on the side. Absolute value of delta is this. Okay. Absolute value of the eigenvalues. Okay. And this is all of them. We can break it into two terms. You know, I, which is the lambda is greater than zero, right? Plus I. Less than zero absolute value. And then from the definition, this right here is delta minus. And then the lambda i's are positive anyway, so the absolute value signs don't matter. So then it's the same as delta minus. So that's like a precise, you know, very more detailed argument for why this equality holds. Okay. Um, is everything all right so far? It's kind of like fair math winner over here. All right, so let's rewrite this one more time. Trace of delta plus plus trace delta. We know that Delta minus is equal to delta plus plus b minus a. Why is that? Well, we're just setting these two equal to each other. A minus b is equal to delta plus minus delta minus. And then um, we're, we're, manip we're rewriting that equality together. Right? All right. So if I take um, this and bring it to the other side of A minus B. If I bring this over here, I get delta plus minus delta minus. All right? Okay. So, yes. Here we have delta minus. Let's substitute here. We'll get, um, okay. Uh, oh. Our statement is that all this can be put together. Get the trace of delta plus is equal to half the trace distance minus trace of b minus a. Okay, how do we get that? Um, it's it's just algebra.
So we can rewrite the trace distance like this. But let's abbreviate things a bit because we're starting to get a bit crowded. Okay, so we have this. We have this. Um, if we substitute in here for delta minus delta plus plus q minus a, and we get um, twice trace of delta plus plus q minus a. Uh, trace of q minus a. Okay. And then this last line is just bringing this over here, trace of B minus A to the left, and then dividing by two. That's all it is, right? So it's all, it's all just algebraic stuff. Are we all right? Okay. Um, good. So now, We're just going to substitute uh, this expression for trace of delta plus uh, into here, this lower one. So let's, let's recollect where we are. The objective function for an arbitrary m is greater than trace of a minus trace of delta. So our final step is to substitute this expression for trace of delta plus, and then we arrive at the lower bound. Then that's the end of the proof of the lower bound. Um, so we get this right here. So this is kind of a pause moment if you have any questions about what happened. But just to summarize, like we took the objective function. This was the main idea. Uh, this is called Jordan-Hahn decomposition. Jordan-Hahn to mathematicians. And we just did some, this was the main step where we got an inequality. We drop delta minus, use the fact that M is a measurement operator less than identity, we get the frown. And then that, that was kind of the stopping point for inequalities. Okay? Then there are just some substitutions and rewritings to get traces. And we get the lower bound. All right. So indeed, that is the next step. Yes. Um, okay. So now um, to achieve the infimum, the question is how to pick the measurement operator, right? Um, so we need to pick a measurement operator that will saturate this these inequalities. Any ideas? Interesting idea. Um, first question, is that a measurement operator? Is it? <laughs> Sorry. Are you sure? It was the lamp rod. Do you get the right idea? Take a projection. Good. That's precisely it. So. The idea is to pick um, M equal to pi plus the projection onto the positive eigenspace of A minus A. Pi plus precisely will be what AB said, this operator without the lambda. That is a projection operator, which is a legitimate measurement operator. Good. 
So why does it work? Remember, in the whole proof, this was the only place where there were inequalities. We have to check if we choose M like this, are the inequalities saturated? Um, if, you, if you take trace of M times delta plus, you get delta plus, right? So the trace of pi plus times delta plus is trace of delta plus, right? Because this pi plus is a projection onto the subspace spanned by this operator. Right? So it's just like, you know, the filters for that. And then the other part of the filter is the trace of pi plus times delta minus is zero. The subspaces are orthogonal. Right? We already said, and you can see it. Delta plus is orthogonal to delta minus, but also implies that pi plus is orthogonal to delta minus. So it's zero. And so then, because uh, for this choice, of, so pi plus, when we choose m equal to pi plus, um, m times delta minus is zero, this inequality is saturated. And then because trace of pi plus delta plus is Trace of delta plus these inequality, this inequality is saturated. So that's that's the proof, right? Those are the only places where inequalities, and um, you know everything else was just equality. So this is a very important. Uh, this is an optimal measurement operator. So, you know, this was all just using mathematical formalism, but now there's a challenge if you want to implement this experimentally, right? Like, how would you, how would you implement this in general, right? That's, that's a hard question. Um, and there's a precise, there's a very precise, uh, we don't do complexity theory in this course. There's a precise sense in which this measurement is actually Hard to implement our quantum computer. The computation is complex. Right? So that, that means in general, over like all possible density operators, we could be generated by quantum circuits. But that shouldn't stop you from trying to solve it for interesting cases. You know, um, there, there are a variety of cases that are that are known, which you can implement. All right. So that's that's kind of the end of our discussion for symmetric hypothesis. Um, we can reconnect later to this. What I said before, we haven't made it clear yet, is that there are fundamental links between this basic task of hypothesis testing and communication. And so there's there's ways to use these ideas to design uh, or at least argue for achievability of communication schemes. And you can take this, the idea behind this measurement to design uh, decoding measurements for communication. Okay. And um, yeah, so we'll return to that later. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to a different kind of hypothesis testing. Oh, we will not. Um, <laughs> we will talk about asymptotics. All right, so we're, we're not done with symmetric hypothesis testing yet. We're going to talk about the asymptotic. Uh, but I'm going to erase uh, gamma and stuff. So what do I mean by asymptotics? I mean, rather than thinking about this in terms of a single copy of the state, we're going to suppose that you have available multiple copies of the states to figure out which one was preferred. And you know, let's 
kind of like what we do in information theory. We consider many uses of a channel or many instances of a resource. We want to know how the resources scale with the number of systems available. That was how we defined capacity. Okay. And we're going to prove something called the quantum channel. We're going to argue one side of it. We're not going to prove the whole thing. So this is the funny thing about quantum information is that uh, Chernoff is a mathematician who proved the classical version of this result in like 1950. And um, he had nothing to do with quantum information or anything, but his name is on the screen. That's how it works. <laughs> like we have quantum Fisher information, we have quantum Chernoff bounds. Um, well, there are other people who did this in like 2006 whose names might possibly be forgotten <laughs> because their names are there. Anyway, all right, so this is the asymptotic limit. of symmetric hypothesis. So what I was saying before is that it's intuitive. I mean, think of these pictures. This is the kind of picture we were thinking about before. There's a quantum system prepared as rho or sigma. And then you're allowed to do a measurement to figure out which one is prepared, right? And um, the box is a question mark because it's, it's, it's unknown which state it's prepared. Okay. Then you could change the game where there's two boxes and they're either, it's called um, omega. So omega is either rho or sigma. Okay. The point is that both systems are prepared in the same state. Now what you could do to distinguish them is a, what we call collective measure. This is a measurement that acts jointly on both systems. They could be qubits, for example. Right? So you can compare this with a classical strategy. A classical strategy for this would be do individual measurements, get some results, and do, then do some classical computation. To, have to make a decision about which state was prepared, right? That would be what would be called a classical strategy. Um, to implement this collective measurement, you might need a quantum computer, right? You, you might need to, um, something we can argue, I think we kind of essentially argued it is that General measurement can be implemented by doing a, a unitary and then individual measurements. Okay, so that's the difference between this picture and this picture. Like with a classical strategy, you're not allowing for any interaction, any quantum interaction between the systems before making a decision. Whereas with a collective measurement, you can allow for a unit. Um, and then there's, you know, this was two copies of the state. There's no reason why you couldn't allow for four copies. Or in general, the picture would be. N copies of this thing. You allow for a collective measure. Okay. And what we know is that in like non-degenerate cases of interest, the error probability 
uh, decays exponentially with the number of properties. So it goes very rapidly to zero. And then what we want to figure out is how fast. What is that exponent? That's called the error exponent, the optimal error exponent. So the optimal error probability is exponentially fast. The situation looks like this. When I wrote, I don't know if we've done this yet. Um, if, if we write rho tensor n with the tensor in the exponent, it kind of means what you think. So it just means. And full tensor power. Just like with ordinary multiplication. Okay. So the statement we're making is that the error decays exponentially fast with some uh, exponents. And this is the theorem we're prove is that this is going to be the uh, quantum. Chernoff divergence. That's that's the name for it. Divergence is a term that comes from uh, statistics. It has to do with how it's a measure of distinguishability. How different are, is rho from sigma? Like, I guess it's like how fast do they diverge from each other? This n is getting larger. Okay, that's kind of the rough idea. The theorem that we'll argue one side of, this is called the quantum Chernoff bounds. So it's the, in the limit, as n goes to infinity, right? I want you to take this approximate equality, apply a negative law, divide by n's of both sides. And when you do that, you get this C, right? Uh, negative. And this is for all uh, lambda strictly between zero and one. So this. Uh, oh. Um, so often what we do is, okay, you might ask me like, why don't you just call this C? Okay. Um, you could argue that, well, let, let's define this first. So this, this C is the quantum uh, Chernoff divergence and it's um, supremum over parameter S strictly between zero and one. Negative log so that's that's the function that's the mathematical expression okay. okay so this is the kind of thing we often seek out in quantum information theory the left hand side is a strictly operational quantity, right? It's an optimal error exponent. The right hand side is a mathematical expression. It's a simple function to compute a row and sigma, right? So this is uh, a very beautiful thing. You know, like in Shannon's theorem for data compression, we did a whole thing where we defined what the operational setting was. And then 
we, we, we kind of argued using typicality that, oh, the data compression limit is the entropy, right? which is like this complicated operational thing. And then it just reduces to this beautiful mathematical expression. Right? With communication, it was the same, but with mutual information. Right? So now we're doing something very similar, except the, you know, we get a different answer. There's a different operational setting. Good. So, how do we prove it? We're going to prove one side of it. We're not going to prove the other side. Because, well, make a decision. The other side of it is in the book, if, if you're curious. So, we are going to prove what's called uh, the achievability part. So, we will prove. That the operational quantity is greater than the Chernoff divergence. Okay. How we're going to prove it, we're going to need a mathematical lemma. Um, this will occupy more space. So we're going to look at the um, this this expression that we were looking at previously, right? That was equal to the um, minimal error problem. But we're going to again use general positive semi-definite matrices A and B. So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to get an upper bound on it. This upper bound will hold for all s between zero and one. Right? I should speak a little bit about um, why why this is somehow challenging. Okay. Let's have an aside over here. We know that the error probability with n copies is this. Uh, when, you, when you plug in states, you know, lambda rho tensor n, one minus lambda sigma tensor n. We got one minus trace distance of rho tensor n minus one minus lambda sigma tensor n. This function gets very difficult to compute as n gets larger. Okay. Um, why is that? Well, if these are qubit systems, then you, when n gets larger, the Hilbert space is getting exponential in n. Right? So it's hard to compute. Whereas with this upper bound, if we, and this is what we'll do later, um, if you have this, you get everything's going to be much simpler to work with. Sigma tensor n to the power x. So you have that trace, and um, let's go back here with this notation. If I put a power s in everything, it's the same as this. Then the power s uh, distributes over each of them, right? So that's you know some linear algebra. <clears throat> but then the trace of a, a tensor product is just um, the multiplication of the individual traces. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, lambda doesn't scale with n. That's part of the problem. So lambda is a fixed constant. That's that helps to answer 
address your question, right? Like this, like, Lambda is, yeah, so it is assumed in this, in all of these hypothesis testing problems. In fact, anything we'll write in this class that, um, you know, whatever are like the quantum states or probabilities involved, those are known. There's no, like we assume that systems have been characterized. Or, yeah, the only thing that's unknown is once the game goes, which, what is the value of omega? That's the objective of the game to figure it out. So, um, Indeed, it doesn't scale within. I think the best answer, in, indeed, uh, the expression does not depend on n. So um, it's a constant independent n lambda. Also, what will happen is um, I think lambda will be like a multiplicative factor under the log. And then we take the log, it'll become additive, but then you divide it by n. So it just goes away. The main thing you need is that land is strictly greater than zero, strictly less than zero. Yeah. That's a good question. All right, so going back to this, this will then simplify to lambda. I mean, actually, you see it right here. All right, this was one minus x, sorry, one minus x. One minus lambda, one minus s. And then this whole thing will simplify to trace rho to the s sigma to the one minus s all to the nth power, right? So now you see it, at least with this upper bound, if you then take a negative log, n comes out, there's no n here, you divide by n, take the limit, this goes away, you're left with this, which is the Chernoff expression, right? So that's, that's how you get one side of the theorem. When you take a negative log, this inequality sign flips to a greater, right? Um, yeah. Um, we should say other things. So if rho and sigma, let's suppose rho and sigma are the same state. Right. Then, uh, like sigma equals rho, then this expression collapses to trace of rho, which is one, negative log of that is zero. And so the, 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 the decay rate is, is zero, like, but that's because you couldn't figure out, you know, we assume the states are the same. So there's consistency. Um, another extreme which is kind of a singularity that it's easy to interpret is if rho is orthogonal to zero, to, to sigma, right? If we're distinguishing zero from one, then um, if we're orthogonal, the trace of this expression will be zero, negative log of that is infinity. That's consistent with the error probability of zero, right? The negative log of zero is infinity. So that's another extreme. And then the interesting stuff is all in between, like, you know, states where this is actually a finite number or different from zero. And then you can also show that this measure is faithful, like, if it's equal to zero, that implies that the states are the same. Right. So, um, unless there's any questions, to prove this, this will be more math, <laughs> which I think is interesting because, you know, if you're interested in doing work in quantum information, ultimately at some point you're faced with like proof. Okay. The original paper that proved this had a very complicated proof. Um, it used like uh, integral representations of functions of operators and interesting proof but quite complex and then a little bit after that a Japanese mathematician Nozawa figured out a much simpler proof and so that's what we'll present here um, 
and we'll use ideas like operator monotonicity. I think that's all we need. Operator monotonicity of the function of x to the s, or x is an operator. Okay. So unless there's any questions, we'll proceed with the proof of this. All right. We're gonna do the same trick, delta, right? So delta is A minus B, delta plus minus delta minus. We're back to that. If you didn't like it, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Something. All right. Um, so, good question. Once we have the lemma, um, indeed, the, the proof of this lower bound is done. Why don't, why don't we finish that train of thought? Um, so this this right here, uh, this first line is the error probability, right? Uh, that's it. And now let's just use the definitions, like you said, negative log divided by n, take the limit. Let's, let's write it out. Um, all right, yeah. Okay, so yes, th thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> um, so we apply a negative law to the top line, the bottom line, inequality flips divided by n. Um, now we take the limit. And we get now. Um, all right, so this left hand side is what we'll call C. That's like the operational quantity. Okay, so then on the operational quantity, which is the limited thing on the left. We get this lower bound, but the lower bound holds for all x. For all x between zero and one. So then we're allowed to take a supremum. We got the, the lower bound. All right? Good. So now let's uh, let's move on to the proof of this point. <clears throat> And this is this is pretty interesting, I would say. We, we'll use the main idea will be uh, operator monotonicity, so you'll you'll get some exposure to how to use that in a proof. Okay, what we previously showed is that the trace distance of a minus b is equal to trace of delta plus plus trace of delta minus. And, um, all right, then we can do things like A plus B is equal to A minus B plus two B, it's kind of simple. And substitute for A minus B delta plus minus delta minus. Then we can use this 
to rewrite this quantity on the left as trace of B minus trace of W. I suppose we could have done this simply before because our, if you remember, our previous lower bound on this quantity was trace of A minus delta plus, right? But then we could use this relation to say, to, to get this claim right here. Is it all right? All right, so with this rewriting, it suffices to prove trace of B minus trace of delta minus. So that's equivalent to the desired statement. All right. Now we know that B plus delta plus is greater than A. Operator inequality. Why is that? B is positive, same definite, extra definite needed for this. But the key thing is that delta plus is positive, same definite. Right? So we know that A minus B is delta plus minus delta minus. So we use that to rewrite the upper bound. As, um, plus delta minus. We're saying that this, this expression here is equal to this one. The, the left hand side of both inequalities are equal by using this equation. All right? So now, now we use the operator monetization. This implies that um, <coughs> A plus delta minus to the S is greater than B to the S. For all s between zero and one. That's operator monotonicity of x to the s for s between zero and one. So this is what we're going after. Um, we're going to flip it around. We're going to show the trace of b minus this expression is less than this expression. Uh, clever use of operator monotonicity. Okay, first trick is to rewrite this as one expression. Why can you do that? B to the S times B to the one minus S is B. Okay. The trace of B, this is the same. Okay. Good. Now we use the fact of B is positive semi definite, and now we're going to use this operator in equality. Substitute in. So yeah, to, to use that, to, to arrive at this conclusion, we're using the fact that B is positive semi-definite. And also this operator applies to bound this one by All right, now what? 
Um, let me ask you this. Is this operator positive semi-definite? Interesting little quiz. Yes, all right, now you get pick my why. Oh, sorry. This operator is this operator positive some depth. Did you say yes? Or... Uh, like binomial? Binomial. Interesting. A plus B will find S. I'm a plus will find S. A plus, you mean A plus delta minus? A plus delta minus. And delta minus is positive set definitely. That's right. Um, possibly, I had something simpler. I don't know. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's what I was. I mean, like what you're saying might be true. I, I don't want to dismiss it, but I just had like, I think there's, um, you, you can argue it like this, like we just did, right? So, like, in fact, like, see it? So, and that's what you're thinking, right? All right. So, like, A plus delta minus is greater than A, right? If delta minus is positive, semi definite, and now operator minus S. This is positive sum definite. Good. That means we can use this bound again. Uh, sorry, we can use this one, but substitute for s one minus s, right? If s is between zero and one, so is one minus s. All right, so we use that. Uh, A plus delta minus one minus s. This is pretty clever. That's the thing with clever proofs. Like each step is relatively easy to follow, but to construct this is a challenge. Right? So, um, yeah. Um, all right. So let's multiply it all out. So there's this first term times this term right here. S the powers of S and one minus S so that we multiply them, the power is one. That's beautiful. Um, trace of A plus delta minus, and then minus uh, A to the S, A plus delta. And now we use yes. We use this one more time, but now I'm going to do one minus s. And uh, there's a minus sign in front. And so we're going to use this inequality rather than this. Why don't we sorry, let's do one equality beforehand to make things much clearer, I think. Take the individual traces. That's fine, right? All right, so now we're going to use this one. We'll put a minus sign in front. The inequality flips. We're going to use this. Now we can get an upper bound. All right. Okay. So this expression here is just trace of that, right? A to S is one minus S. These cancel. That's the desired inequality. Right? So we did the whole thing. Top line less than the bottom. Let me write it for another. Right. 
point. So that was the whole proof. However, um, I don't know how much we learned from that in like a quantum information sense. You get to see how operator monotonicity can be used in a very clever way. A proof, maybe. Any questions about any aspect of the proof? I can do a, I can do a recap. That would be helpful. All right. Um, so this was the desired statement. Let me use a different here. This was the desired statement. Um, we rewrote the lower bound as this. Okay. Then we said, oh, okay, well, the desired statement is equivalent to this right here. And then actually, what we did was we said we took this, but these two, so it's actually right there. Which is the okay. Um, That's what that was our that became our next target. And, and the rest of it was kind of like clever rewritings and operator monotonicity. So <clears throat> this operator quality holds because delta plus is positive, positive semi-definite. But then you can use this identity. To rewrite the upper bound like this. Okay. So then we rewrote the lower bound here like this. Um, B can factor as B to the S, B to the one minus S, that's what we did here. Then our first use of operator monotonicity, sorry, um, from this inequality, we then deduced this one. Using operator monotonicity. Right. Okay. Argue this step, we have to say this is positive semi definite, and this operator is less than this one. Right. That holds because of this right here. We got that. And then we argue that this operator is, this operator is positive semi definite. Um, that was just from minus a and then operator minus this okay. positive semi definite. So, because that's positive semi definite, we can then use the same inequality for this term that s flipped to one minus a. Okay. Then we you know, multiply this out, S plus one minus S is one, so we cleanly get A plus delta minus there. Then we did some rewritings. And then finally used um, this inequality, which is again, just like, you know, A plus delta minus is greater than A, operator minus so this is the focus on. So, you know, the whole thing was just <laughs> never used to operate in that test. Okay. So we have about seven minutes. Um, I think we I think we should stop for today. <laughs> we're just be going into kind of a new concept and all right. Homework due today at 4 p.m.